Hi and welcome back. In our last video we finished the second phase of our design for our project website here. And that was adding the content to the HTML structure that we created in the first phase. We're now ready to go ahead and begin learning about CSS so that we can create the CSS necessary to format and lay out this design. Now, just as we had a review of HTML before we created the HTML for this page, we're going to go ahead now and start a review of CSS or an introduction to CSS. I shouldn't have said review. Um, but we'll have a good general introduction to CSS here. And again, at first, CSS can be a little bit overwhelming when you start to learn to use it. Just as HTML can seem a little bit overwhelming, but as you probably noticed as we went through the HTML more and more and did the sort of the same things over and over again, it starts to become clear the pattern that you're going to use. And it also becomes sort of clear that um, it's not a very difficult language to learn. And the same thing is going to be true of CSS. There are a few more rules and it's a little bit more complex than HTML. But it's definitely not something um, that is overly complex. It just takes a little bit of time and practice to get it down. And there are so many benefits to using CSS for um, formatting and laying out your pages um, that it's well worth really investing in learning um, CSS well. And as a matter of fact, if you're going to use a product like Microsoft Expression Web or Adobe Dreamweaver, you have to know CSS in order to really format and lay out your pages. There's no way you can really do it just by clicking on buttons. Or if you did, it would be more trouble to learn how to do it that way than it would just to learn the um, semantics of CSS. So. Before we start this lesson, one more thing. Just as I had a handout for HTML, I also have a handout here for CSS. And you can download this handout from my website. And again, it's got all the notes that you're going to need, as well as a vocabulary list for this introduction to CSS. And you can see here, it's not too terribly long. It's a few pages. And I'll go ahead and scroll through this. If you can't download the uh, file, you can feel free to type this information in. And there's page two. And you'll see it's just all the notes that you need for this lesson. And then another point that we're going to cover in a bit of detail in a future video is going to be something called the CSS box model. And that's going to be very important for us to uh, learn. And then finally, I have here a CSS properties vocabulary list. And just as we had a simple vocabulary list for HTML that we needed to learn, we have a simple vocabulary list here for CSS, for the essential properties that we need to learn. And I've divided them up into a few categories, text properties, box model properties, other properties here. And there's a few more on this page, but you can see there aren't a whole lot of properties that you need to memorize in order to really effectively use CSS. And these are going to be the only properties that we use in the course of laying out our page. So once you know these, you've got a reasonably good handle on not doing everything with CSS, but doing a lot of things with CSS and definitely making a clean professional website layout like what we have here. So consider downloading that um, handout along with the completed project and framework. Well, here I am back in Expression Web. And I don't want to actually continue using our main as our test file here. So what I'm going to go ahead and do for um, the next few lessons is I'm going to right click up here, do new and HTML. And I'm going to go ahead and create a file called test.html. 
And I also need to go ahead and create a CSS style sheet for this. So I'm going to come go ahead and whoops, come into my CSS folder right here. Right click on it and do new and CSS. And I'm just going to go ahead and call this styles.css. So we created two new pages, test.html and styles.css. Now, included with the framework files um, is going to be another set of test HTML pages. And if you've downloaded the framework, you can also download, and the completed project, you can also download these. And if not, you'll see the code that you need to type in. But there is my HTML CSS test pages here. And when I go ahead and open that up, you'll see there are a few files here. And for this uh, exercise, I want to go ahead and use test1.html. So I'm going to go ahead and right click on that and say edit with Microsoft Expression Web. And you'll see Expression Web comes back up and here is our test page. This is the content we want for our test page. And again I'm going to go ahead and select all of this and copy it. And then I'm going to go ahead and close that out. Open the test page that I created do a select all and a paste to paste that in. And again, I'll go ahead and go through the code here. So if you don't have that, you can go ahead and type the information on in to our page. And you can see here, I don't have a whole lot of code in here. Just a couple of divs that just have some basic HTML inside of it and there's a second div and the information in there. And I'm going to go ahead and save that and we can begin work on learning our CSS. Now the first thing that you need to learn about CSS is the way you need to link your CSS file to your HTML file. We need some way of telling the browser that when it looks at test.html it should use this style sheet styles.css to format that page so we need to link test.html this page here to this css style sheet and the code that you're going or the tag that you're going to use is going to be the link tag right here and basically the link tag is going to have four different attributes inside of it. It's going to have the href attribute which points to the CSS file that you're using. Now in this case the default here says test.css and it's inside of the CSS folder. Well, we didn't call our CSS file test.css, we called it styles.css. So I actually need to change that to styles.css. So this first attribute points to the style sheet that you wish to use to format this HTML page. The second attribute is rel or relationship. And this defines the type of relationship between this file and the file that we're linking to. And in this case, we're saying this file that we're linking to, styles.css, is a style sheet. Now, there are different kinds of style sheets that you can create and use. And that's where the type attribute comes in. In this case, the value for type is text slash CSS. And that just indicates the type of style sheet that we're using. And finally, the fourth attribute is the media attribute. And that defines what kind of output device this style sheet should be used for. And there are two primary values that you can use here, screen and print. If you use screen, anytime this web page, this HTML document, is shown on a monitor, 
well that's going to be the style sheet that's going to be used for it but you've probably also noticed that when you go to some web pages and print the page out it prints out much differently than what's displayed on the screen for example when you print out an article on a blog or on a news site it may not contain all the header information and the images and the sidebars with the links and the footers and all that rest of that stuff all the advertising in that case it's using a separate print style sheet to format the page for the printer and it sets up the fonts and the sizes differently it omits a lot of the information that you don't want to print like the heading information and the sidebar information so on and so forth so you can have and there are more than two different types of media st uh, style sheets but again the two most popular ones are screen and print and in another video we'll talk more about print style sheets but for this series we're just going to deal with um, screen style sheets. So this is the statement that links this HTML page to this style sheet. And in general, you're going to be able to use this exact statement here in any website that you use, you create or work with. The only thing different is going to be the path right here. And again, that just needs to point to wherever you've created and named your CSS style sheet. So now we've established a link between the two. Now, after you've established a link between the two, you should test your page, or you should test your link. And I'm going to come in here to Design View, and you can see here I've got um, a heading here. This is the main heading for Section 1, and this is the main heading for Section 2. And these are h1 tags and I'm just gonna really quickly go into my style sheet here by double clicking on it and I'm gonna create a really quick style just to test to make sure that the link is working and this is going to be a style that's going to format the first level headings and it's going to change the color of the text so I'm gonna go ahead and do color and then I'm going to go ahead and say I'm going to select fuchsia here and save it and let's go into our test.html and look and now you can see my h1s are now in that pink color so I know that there is a successful connection between these two um, pages And I just actually noticed one thing that we need to go ahead and change before we continue in just the settings for Expression Web. I'd like you to go ahead and go to the Tools menu and select Page Editor Options. And we were here before on the IntelliSense tab. So click IntelliSense at the top. And if you see where it says here under Auto Insert, CSS Selector, Closing Brace, I want to go ahead and uncheck that. At the end of um, this video series, we're going to talk more about some of these page editor options and why you would want to turn these off or on. But for the purposes of learning CSS, we want to go ahead and turn that off. So I'm going to go ahead and click OK. And then I'm going to go ahead and delete that style. Now, starting to think about CSS there are three different main types of CSS styles and CSS by the way stands for cascading style sheet we'll talk more about what that means in a little bit but there are three main types of CSS styles there are tag styles there are class styles and there are ID styles tag styles, class styles, and ID styles. And you write your CSS styles in the same way. It's just the way those are applied or the way those are used are slightly different. Tag styles format specific tags in your HTML. 
So for example, earlier I did an H1 tag and you saw how it went and it automatically found all the H1s and formatted it using that style rule. Class styles and ID styles do the same thing just slightly differently. They both take whatever element has that class or that ID and formats it with the styles that um, you've used in that particular definition. And that's where it links in here to the IDs that we used those divs for. And again, that's going to be a little bit confusing at first. But just remember, tag styles, they go find an HTML tag and format the contents according to what the style is. ID styles, find the element with the matching ID in your HTML. And then they format that element according to the rules in that style. And class styles in the same way, if I was to do class equals active here, the class name or the class style active will be applied to that element because I went ahead and added that attribute to this particular element. And again, we're going to get practice on writing all three of these. But the first type of item that we're going to focus on are tag styles. But again, remember, tag styles, class styles, ID styles, they're all basically written in exactly the same way. Now, when you have a style, it's always going to follow this format. You're going to have the name of the style followed by a curly brace. After the curly brace, you're going to have one or more property value statements. And a property value statement is ended with a semicolon. And again, you can have one property value statement in your style, or you could have multiple property value statements. But once you're finished, you go ahead and close your curly brace. So what this says is the style with this name has these properties and corresponding values. Now let's go ahead and I'm going to look at my handout here really quickly. You can see here text properties. For example, we have the font size text property. So in our style, we could have a property called font size. And then we would separate the property name from the value with a colon. And then we might do 12 pixels for the actual value. So what this would be saying is anything that's formatted with this style or with the style with this name should have these properties with these values associated with them. So again, I'm going to go ahead and delete that. And this is going to be the format that all of your styles are going to follow. Now, just like HTML, CSS doesn't care about white space. So I could write this style exactly like this, where I have the name and the opening curly brace on one line, and then each property value statement on a different line, and then finally a closing brace. Or I could type it like this, name, curly bracket, font size, 12 pixels, and close my curly bracket. So again, this is all about making it readable how you indent and break things up into multiple lines. Also, CSS is not case sensitive with one exception. So all of this could be an uppercase, lowercase, doesn't matter. What does matter is the case of the style name. And that should match whatever you've used 
in your HTML. So if the ID here is section one, all lowercase, you should write it the exact same way over here. And again, if I was to go ahead and if I had multiple values, I could do name, curly brace, and then the properties and values, and then close my curly brace on a different line. Or I could do name, curly brace, and I could put those all on the same line. And in this case, I've got some extra space in there. That doesn't matter. Remember, the spaces are ignored. But actually, if I was doing this for real, I'd take the extra spaces out of there. So this is the exact same thing as this. This is the exact same thing as this. And you could even combine them. Let's say I have more than three property value statements for these. I could very easily go ahead and continue my property value statements on the next line just like that. Or I could have extra properties on here. Let me go ahead and copy that. So all of these are valid ways of writing styles. You just need to determine what's the most readable for you. And again, all that's necessary is a name, an opening curly bracket, and a closing curly bracket. And then inside of those curly brackets, however you choose to write them, are one or more property value statements. Remember, your property is separated from your value by a colon. And the entire property value statement is ended with a semicolon. And sometimes people call these property value statements. Other times people call them um, CSS, just CSS statements. Either one works. I usually call them property value statements. But remember, they have to be ended with a semicolon. The one exception to that is if you just have one property value statement, you can omit the semicolon and the style will still work but it's terrible form to do that and a rotten habit to get into. So for our purposes, we're always going to close our property value statements with a semicolon. And again, you write your CSS property or your CSS styles in exactly the same way whether it's a tag style, a class style, or an ID style. And again, if you want to get an idea of the different properties that you can use in CSS, this cheat sheet here is going to give you the most common ones with the definition associated with them. So let's go ahead now and let's create our first style. And I want to go ahead and create a style that's going to format my H1s, my main headings. I want to change the font, I want to change the font size, and the font color. So I have three things I want to change. The font, the font size, and the color of the text. So I identify that it's a tag style because I'm honing in on, or I'm targeting in on, H1s. The criteria for selecting what would be formatted is the tag name. So I'm going to go in here and I'm going to type H1 and a curly bracket. And then I'm going to hit enter and I'm going to do font dash family. And what that's going to do is it's going to allow me to select the font that I wish to use for my H1s. And you're going to see again Expression Web really helps you out here because it brings up a list of fonts. Now when you're selecting fonts 
for your web pages, there are a few things you need to be aware of. The first is, if you're going to use a font on your web page, the visitor to your site needs to have that font installed on their computer in order for it to show up on your web page. Otherwise, whatever the browser default is will be used in its place. So you can go out and you can find your your special fancy font. Let's say it's called, you know, fancy font. And you could define that in your CSS style sheet. But unless the visitor, unless your site viewer has that font installed on their machine, it won't show up. Now, there are ways to embed fonts into your website. And in another video on CSS, I go into talking about how to do that. The problem is it doesn't really work in all browsers. It works in all newer browsers, but when you get to older browsers, it sort of breaks down. So generally speaking, what most web designers do is they only use fonts that are going to be available on the vast majority of visitors. And what that means is you're going to use fonts like Arial, Times New Roman, Courier, Verdana, Franklin Gothic, to a lesser extent, um, um, fonts like Impact or Georgia or things like that. And you're going to notice here Expression Web gives you some suggestions for some fonts. And I want you to notice that there are multiple fonts on each line here. For example, the first one here is Helvetica, or I'm sorry, is Arial Helvetica Sans Serif. And when I select that, it's going to put all three of those font names on this line. And what's going on here? What, what are we actually telling the browser? What we're saying is to the visitor's browser, if you have the font Arial available to you, use that. And again, most computers do have Arial. But if you get to older Macintoshes, Macintoshes that are running um, system software before OS X, they may not have Arial available. And the same thing might be true is true for Linux computers. They won't have a font named Arial. But what Macs do have is they have a font named Helvetica, which is very similar to Arial. So this says, use Arial, but if you can't find Arial, like if you're an older Mac, see if you have the font Helvetica available. And if you do, use that font. So this would take care of most newer computers and all Windows computers. This will take care of older Macs that may not have Arial. The third font here, Sans Serif, would be used in any computer that you didn't have Arial or Helvetica available in. And an example of this would be a Linux based computer that might not have Arial or Helvetica. And you can see I can make whatever list of fonts that I want here. I just separate them with commas. But again you're generally going to be safest if you stay with Arial, Times New Roman, Courier, and Verdana. Those are going to be fairly safe fonts for you to use. If you want to use a font um, other than sort of those standard fonts, you have let's say a decorative font, then you're going what you're going to do is you're going to turn that headline into a graphic and you're going to insert that image and the image will take the place of the headline. So there's the name of the font that I want to go ahead and use. And then I want to go ahead and set the font size here for my main headings. And in this case, I'm going to go ahead and say that my font heading should be 36 pixels tall. Now, when it comes to units of measurement in CSS, there are quite a few that you can use. There are several that are more common, though. The two that are most common are probably going to be 
are probably going to be pixels as I'm using here or M's and if I did an M it would be EM there. Now for the purposes of this course we're not going to worry about M's. We're just going to go ahead and use pixels and again the abbreviation for that is PX. Now if this was a print style sheet you wouldn't want to use pixels because printers don't deal with pixels. They deal with points more like a traditional word processor. So if we were actually using uh, creating a print style sheet we could use points instead of pixels. But again for the purposes of this exercise all of our um, measurements are going to be in pixels. And then finally we wanted to change the color. Now before I went ahead and selected fuchsia as my color and you could see here I could do blue or I could do red or a variety of different colors that way. The problem is what exactly is blue? There are so many different shades of blue you couldn't count them all. Well in this case the shade of blue that the browser will bring up is probably going to be that same shade of blue that it turns links into by default. And this would be a very bright red. So you can see specifying the color name is going to be very inexact. So you very, very rarely ever, ever use the name of the color. The one or the two exceptions to that are obviously white and black, because white is white and black is black. But most of the time, when you're defining a color in CSS, and again, all of this is in my notes, um, so you have that all there. You can read through that um, later. Um, generally speaking, when you define a color in CSS, you're going to define it by using its hexadecimal color value. Its hexadecimal color value. Now, if I go ahead and type my colon there, it's going to bring up this list again. And you're going to see I have a pick color option. If I select that, you're going to see it comes to this color prism right here. And when I go ahead and select any color in this prism, like let's say I select um, this purple right here, it's going to give you the color values right here. In this case, it's 9966FF. Now, that's not actually the way you're going to write it, but I want you to notice that it's always going to be, or it's almost always going to be, a six digit code and that six digit code is going to be broken into three pairs of two values or three sets of pairs. This is going to be the red value, this is going to be the green value, and this is going to be the blue value. It's the hexadecimal color value for that or it's the hexadecimal value for that color. Now notice here that I have FF. The values that you can use in this place are going to be anything from 0 all the way to F. Anything from 0 all the way to F. Because there are 16 possible values for every digit. Obviously we have 0 through 9, 10 is represented by the letter A, 11 is represented by the color B, so on and so forth, all the way to 15, which is represented by the letter F. Now fortunately you don't have to remember any of this, because when you use Expression Web, if you use this Pick Color option, when you select a color, it's going to automatically, all you do is click OK, and it's going to put that exact color in for you. 
if the color you're looking for isn't in this prism here, you can click on custom and you can mix any color here that your monitor can display. You select the color from right here and then you select the brightness of the color from this slider over here. So let's say I wanted this this particular shade of green right here. I could select that and click OK. There's the color value right there. And when I click OK, there is that color. The individual values range from 0, which is black, all the way to F, which is white. Or 0, which means an absence of that color, to F, which means that color turned all the way up. And again, as we go through colors, and as you, if you go through my CSS series, we'll go more into depth about what these color codes mean. But again, one of the expression web's um, real values is the fact that you do have these tools like pick color that will automatically look up the value and insert it in there for you. Only other thing that I will uh, mention before we leave here is you need to make sure that you prefix the hexadecimal value with a number sign. So there we go. We have our tag style created that's going to format our H1s with this font, this font size, in this color. And let's look at our test page and you can see that element, those H1s, have changed. Now, what if you wanted to target a, an element to appear a certain way on your page, but it's not always going to have the same tag? Like, let's say sometimes you're going to want certain things in red, and other times you're not going to want, or you're going to want them to show up in just the default color. And let's say we wanted this heading, this subheading to appear in red, but not this one here. We wanted a couple of these list items to appear in red, and maybe this paragraph down here. So in one case we've got an H2, we've got a P tag, we've got an LI down here. So there is no tag that we can identify, because the heading here would look different than the heading here. And that's the case when you're going to want to use a class style. A class style. And again, the difference between a class style and a tag style, tag styles automatically format any element that meets that tag's criteria. In, this, in the previous example, we did it with H1s. Whereas a class style is going to apply that style to whatever element has that class attribute associated with it. So again, you write this in exactly the same way. The only exception is you can name your class style whatever you want, but it has to begin with a period. So class styles always begin with a period. And I'm going to go ahead and call this class style blue. And again, you can call it whatever you want. And then I'm going to do an opening curly bracket, and I'm going to do color, and then pick color, and I'm going to go ahead and select this shade of blue here. And I'm going to go ahead and make it italic as well. So the property that I'm going to use for that is going to be font style, and the value is going to be italic. And again, in the cheat sheet, all of these styles or all these properties are listed and it explains what they do. And then I'm going to close my curly bracket. And so now I have a style called blue, a class style called blue, that changes the color and makes the font italic. Now when I look at my HTML, 
that obviously hasn't been applied anywhere because I haven't added my class style to anything um, in my HTML. Ignore this image right here. We're going to get to that in just a second. So I'm going to go into the code view here. And again, let's say I want this H2 to appear in that class. I'm going to go ahead and say class equals quote blue. Close my quote. One big point of confusion here for people that are beginning to write CSS, when you define the style, you prefix it with a period. But when you apply the style using the class attribute, there is no period. It's just class equals blue. So that style is going to be applied to that H2. Now we'll go ahead and apply it to one of these list items right here. Class equals, whoops, quote, and you'll see the CSS hinting that comes up here gives you all the class styles that have been defined in the style sheet. So I can just simply select that and close my quote. And we'll do it to one more element here. Let's go ahead and do this to that P tag. Class equals blue. We'll save that. So I've applied this to three elements, an H2, an LI, and a paragraph. And now let's look at this in design view. And you can see this is now blue and italic. This is now blue and italic. And this is now blue and italic. So you write the class style in exactly the same way. I used a different format here, but you know I could have written this just like this. So that it was exactly the same as the previous one. Does the line breaks and the tabs don't matter. What matters is the fact that this is a class style, not a tag style. And that means that any time I call out the class blue on any element in my HTML, this style definition is going to be applied to that element. Now, ID styles work in exactly the same way as class styles. The only difference is that ID styles, instead of being applied with the class attribute, are applied with the ID attribute. So here we can see I have this div that has the ID section 1, and this div which has the ID section 2. More often than not, class styles are used to format semantic elements like um, list items and paragraphs and headings. IDs are again most commonly associated with divs or spans. And that's not exclusively. I could apply an ID style to a list item. That's just sort of normal practice. Now let's see the difference here. First off, could you create a tag style for div? Well, sure you could. I could just do div here and then background dash color and I can pick a color here and I can say the background color I want to be like a light orange color or a light red color here. So I'll go ahead and select that color do my semicolon and my closing curly brace. And now when I go ahead and look at my test.html, you're going to see these divs now have that pinkish background color on them. Because again, this style says go find any div and apply the background color, this background color to them. So if I wanted to do this a little bit differently, let's say I wanted to target this section 2 div for a background color, as opposed to all the divs, I could just simply change that. And instead of making it a tag style, I would make it an ID style. And I would say section 2 there. 
just as class styles need to be prefixed with a period, ID styles in your style sheet should be prefixed with the number sign. And now when I go ahead and go into test.html, you can see that that second div here has had that style applied to it. This first div here has not. And again, that's because the style is being applied based on the ID, not the tag. And if I was to go ahead and, again, I could create a, an ID style for whatever I want. I can go ahead and create an ID style and call it um, green here. And I can say the font color is going to be um, a green color. Semicolon curly bracket. And I could come in here to my test.html. And I could come in here to, let's say, this paragraph element here. And I could say ID equals green. And whoops, I need to make sure I got that. I put that in quotation marks there. ID equals green. And again, remember you don't have to use the number sign when you're applying it, just as we didn't have to use the period when we apply a class style. So this style will be applied now to this element here. And let's look at it in design view. And sure enough, that has changed to green. So a lot of similarities between class styles and ID styles. The main difference is that an ID can only be applied to one element on a page where a class a style can be applied to multiple elements on a page. And that's the reason why IDs are usually associated with divs. IDs usually name the major sections in your code, like banner, top nav, logo, content, sidebar, so on and so forth. And I'm going to go ahead and delete that. And we're back to just these here. And I should go ahead and you'll see that paragraph right there. It sort of has an orphaned information here. So I'm going to go ahead and take that off of there. So you're going to see the basic way in this video, or you've seen the basic way in this video that CSS styles are written. In the next video, we're going to go ahead and talk about a few different kinds of styles that you can go ahead and create, a few other different things that you can uh, go ahead and do. We're going to go ahead and stop this video at this point and give you a chance to practice what you've um, learned. So I'll see you in the next video for more information about CSS.